Okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us for uh, the first talk of the morning. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Greg Valiant, who is a professor of computer science at Stanford. Um, as I understand, he works on algorithms, machine learning, statistics, information theory, and the combination of all of those things. And today uh, we'll hear him talk about in-context learning. Okay. Thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks for, thanks for coming. So, uh, so I was going to say, so I'm, uh, um, I'm going to talk about some concrete work, but uh, the, the overall talk is going to embed the concrete work into much more abstract questions. In that sense, I hope this is more of a discussion. Um, feel free to stop me if there's anything I say that uh, you want to clarify or, or, or ask. Um, so the concrete work uh, in the talk is uh, collaborations with uh, Shivam, Dimitris, and, and Percy. Um, good. Okay, so so uh, yeah, we all know about uh, sort of in context learning. Um, um, and again, the, the, the sort of interesting part about in context learning is that it appears that you're learning something, even though none of the weights in your model are being updated, right? Um, so you know, at different times, things like Chat GPT could do a good job of this or not. But uh, you know, think think of this sort of example, right? So I say like. 9 minus 2 equals 11, 13 minus 7 equals 20, blah, blah, blah. What's 4 minus 1? 5. Five. Okay, right? So, so in this case, you've, uh, you know, you've kind of learned that, well, by minus, I actually mean plus. And, um, you know, most people can do this okay. Um, you know, maybe the very best language models can do this. Um, I mean, Abraham Lincoln said that if you call a, a tail a leg, it still has four legs. Right? It's true. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so we'll we'll come back to this sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, very concretely, we'll come back to to maybe this question of what does it mean when your prompt is conditioning on some ludicrous hypothetical? Right. Like, what do you do then? Right? Um, um, these are like the more kind of traditional sorts of in-context learning examples you see. Banana is the yellow, spinach is the green, carrot is probably orange. Um, uh, but you can also do things like this. So uh, let's play this game. So dog is five, mouse is three, ant is one, horse is seven. What, what's a whale? Nine. Nine, yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so maybe this corresponds to size. You could also, maybe this corresponds to longevity or something like that, but, um, you know, um, and uh, people are pretty good at this. Even kids are okay at this. Large language models, eh, you know, the, uh, uh, maybe the very best ones can sort of do some of these things easily. Um, and, okay, so, so in these three things, like in what sense is the in-context learning, learning something? Well, it's learning something about my intent, right? So me, the person who made this prompt, I have something, go, some rule in my head, and in a very concrete sense, the model is learning this thing that's in my head, this model in my head, um, and in, yeah. again, it's not updating any of its weights in the, in the um. okay, and then also, I guess I would also argue that, you know, in context learning, should it, so when we say in context learning, we should mean more than just this sort of stuff, we should also mean things like, you know, suppose I, I try to teach you something, I just pick some random thing. Uh, so fava bean plants, they fix nitrogen. They take nitrogen from the air, N2, and they convert it into ammonium, NH3. That's fixed in the soil. That then can be used by subsequent uh, plants that like, to, that like nitrogen but can't directly get it from the air. Given this, how could a farmer, you know, what could a farmer do to reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer they need to buy? They say, well, maybe they can plant these fava bean plants instead of, um, you know, before they plant their other stuff. Um, and I can even, you know, based on this thing that I supposedly taught you, I can even ask you some, some sort of deeper questions too, right? Like, um, given that plants like nitrogen, if they can't get it from the air, in what form do they find it in the soil? Well, you say, well, maybe they find it in the form of ammonium. I don't know if that's completely true, but this is sort of, uh, you know, I've taught you something and you can manipulate it and come up with non-trivial statements as a function of this. Let's also call this in context learning. None of your synapses have been updated in the process of this. You just, none of your weights have changed, but you can still uh, do some uh, 
appears as if you've learned what I've what I've said, and you can manipulate it. Good. Okay. So so one of the big questions underlying the like the concrete work I'll talk about is this question of do look good language models, human or or computer, um, must they inherently be able to do in context learning? So um, is it true that like any good language model, any model where you, you know you talk to it and it seems like it's doing a good job talking back? Does it need to be able to do this sort of in context learning? Um, so there are lots of questions. So, so if so, if all good language models do this, um, well, one question is like, what uh, what actual learning algorithms have been encoded in these fixed weights? Um, slightly more refined version of asking this: never mind the algorithms, but like, what sorts of function classes uh, can they learn sort of in context, or do they learn in context? Um, and then you know there are, there are these kind of maybe slightly harder to probe questions, but that I think are maybe even more interesting. Um, so if say the large uh, you know trained um, language models, um, if they do kind of inherently do this in context learning, how are the sorts of function thing function classes that they can do in context learning on? How are these encoded or related to the training corpus? Um, And then, I guess the other question is, what does a good language model look like? I can't do this. So suppose you have a really good language model, or as good of a language model as possible, given that it can't really do this sort of in-context learning. What does it look like? Does it look embarrassingly terrible or not? Um, um, and then, you know, if, uh, you know, Good language models don't necessarily need to have a great in context learning ability. Um, well, one natural thing is can language models be improved if you sort of give them the ability to do in context learning? And then, of course, there's a the question of how do you give a large language model this ability? Um, um, I'm just curious, how many people think that language models? A good language model inherently needs to be able to learn without, uh, you know, without sort of updating any weights or without really uh, doing any real processing. How many people think that's not the case? Okay, um, okay. and then uh, maybe at a slightly different to a question, which, which I think from a theory standpoint is pretty interesting. From a practical standpoint, um, it's not exactly clear what we mean. But um, what sorts of tasks um, inherently require weight updates to solve effectively? <clears throat> so yeah, and I'll talk about this a bit more at the very end. Um, the analog for humans is probably this question of you know, what tasks require sleep to learn. Right? So you know, broadly speaking, synaptic. You know, your, your brain doesn't do that much during the daytime. You can remember things and so on. But at night, that's when maybe you know, synapse strength is changed. That's when memories are consolidated and all this. There's a huge volume of work in the you know, cog sci and, uh, and psych literatures um, you know, looking at what sorts of tasks um, can be benefited from sleep. And, and they, you know, what, what goes on is very complicated. There, there are lots of different things that happen. Um, but um, you know there are lots of experiments where you know you're sort of taught something, and then you know half the people in the experiment are given some relaxing. You know they say take a break for two hours, we'll come back. The other half are put to sleep and given like a one hour nap, um, and then you know you do something after after they wake up. And there are lots of tasks where like even a nap is much more effective at improving your ability. Than just taking a break or doing a relaxing thing. Um, not just tasks related to memory consolidation, like people have a decent understanding of the role of sleep for memory consolidation, but other uh, other sorts of things too. Um, um, and a bit later in the talk, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll briefly discuss for large language models, like. Uh, how much better is it if you allow the weights to change versus just doing certain contests? Okay, so going to the like, take, uh, large language models, um, I guess there's this 
question of can large language models really perform in context learning? Um, and the reason this isn't such a silly question is the larger models are, uh, you know, do appear to be better at in context learning. Um, and these larger models, I mean, there's more weird fine tuning and, you know, prompt engineering that is pretty opaque. At least I don't, I don't know what they're doing. Um, and the training corpus is, you know, I don't know that much about the training corpus. So it's not clear what tasks are already in the training corpus versus not. Um, um, so, you know, there is still this question. Of, to, to what extent is this apparent ability to do in context learning just a, just a mirage or a function of the training corpus? So at least the very first question is, you know, can we train a model um, to do in context learning in a real sense where we're going to train this thing from scratch? There's no hidden data sets. We know exactly what we're training on. There's no fine tuning. Um, it's not uh, in context learning. It's not going to be some function of prompt engineering. It's you know, can, can we at least train a model to, to do this? So that's the first question. Okay. So so let me let me uh, let me <coughs> let me describe so probing this question. Then we'll go back to some of the higher level questions. Are we all on on board? Okay. So so what does it mean to to kind of formally do in context learning for some specific function class. Um, well, so we'll, we'll have some distribution, d sub x is going to be a distribution over examples. Think of these examples, maybe these are just vectors, something else. We're going to have a distribution over functions, which map, you know, uh, an example um, to some set. And then we can form a prompt as, you know, here's our example drawn from our distribution of examples. Here's the label drawn by first selecting a function from this distribution and then using that function to label our example, another example, another label, and so on. And then at the end of our prompt, we have our query, and we just want to know, you know, what's this function applied to our query point. And, you know, we'll train a model M, and we can see that this model can do in-context learning. Um, it can learn this uh, um, set of functions or this class of functions with respect to this distribution and this distribution. If, you know, with, with, uh, um, if in expectation, when you cook up a prompt like this from this distribution, you get the, something like the right label for this. So this is like the, think of it as sort of a pack, uh, um, so what it means to have in context, you know, to, to pack in context learn. And in particular, our model M is, uh, you know, it's a fixed model. Nothing, uh, it's not being, uh, no weights are being updated as it jumps through the prompt. Okay, so, um, if this is just the same slide. Um, so what function classes are we going to look at? Well, we're going to start by looking at all the, you know, the, the very simple function classes that a theorist might first write down. So we'll look at first just linear, linear functions in D dimensions. Um, we'll also look at some small, you know, small learning the set of small decision trees. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll do a few other simple function classes. The first question, maybe more concretely instantiated, can we train a model? Maybe a transformer, maybe LSTM, maybe even simpler things, just fully connected deep neural network to in context learn these, these basic function classes with respect to natural distributions over it. Okay, so let me begin with uh, transformer stuff. Um, so, uh, so we look at kind of GP2, GPT2 style uh, transformer architecture. Um, we looked at different size uh, models, but most of our experiments are a model with, with sort of roughly 20 million parameters. Um, uh, smaller models are okay too, but at some point things degrade. Um, and yeah, fairly convenient. You, you, know, you put your prompt in, your label, sorry, your example, label, example, label. 
And then we're just going to look at, you know, uh, so these, these kind of uh, embeddings of what should be the label. And crucially, like, like what comes out here, um, this is like a decoder-only architecture. This, this kind of thing, this label here, is only a function of what comes up through the, the second input. So evaluating the, the sort of uh, uh, the loss, you know, say, well, how good is it at predicting the second label, so the label given one example, the label given two examples, and so on. So, um, okay, so what do, what do people think is going to happen? Of course it learns, right? Um, So, so, uh, so natural starting place. The distribution over examples is just going to be identity covariance Gaussian. D dimensions um, are linear functions. We're going to pick the weight vector uniformly from, again, a D-dimensional identity covariance Gaussian. And I guess this figure will be for 20-dimensional linear functions, we can talk about some scaling laws with the dimension, but maybe I won't do that since I think Surya will do a better job, a more thorough job of that sort of thing. Okay, so this is just an empirical plot of like the, the, uh, the optimal, the base optimal learner, which is just doing least squares. So once you have 20, um, uh, once you have like 20 label points in your context, you should be getting error zero. That you've learned your linear function, and this is roughly how our, you know, your squared, the squared error should decrease linearly. The bumps are just because this is an empirical. So, so th this is a transformer that you specifically trained on this meta learning problem. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So this is this is a baseline of these squares, but yeah, we're gonna we're training a transformer from scratch yeah. to yeah. learn how to do linear regression yeah. in context. Yeah. 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 Um, um, so I'll talk a bit more about what the least squares, like, like what what is the regression algorithm a little bit. But, um, okay, so so this this orange line, which is basically on top of the blue line, this is what the transformer ends up doing. So it's um, uh, it's certainly you know, with respect to this distribution of of uh, examples, it appears to be basically doing regression. So you input uh, a vector of numbers? Yeah. Um, good. So, 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 uh, what, what do you mean? Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we've trained this transformer by first, oh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, maybe the previous slide, right? So, how do we train the transformer? We randomly initialize it, and then we pick a random um, function from, you know, it does a D random d-dimensional vector. We generate this uh, sort of prompt, We're picking all these x's randomly, and then we do you know a training update on the loss that says, yeah, what comes out here should be uh, this f of x one. What comes out here should be this f of x two, and so on. And then the next example, we pick a new random function, a new random linear function from the class, a new random example, and so on. So and you don't prompt it to say, uh, you know, learn this. You just input numbers. We just input numbers. Yeah, yeah. So we're training this from scratch. So it doesn't know language. It doesn't know. It doesn't know anything. So we're just plugging the, in the these prompt, vectors. It figures out that the prompt is to find the function. Um, yeah. So I mean, the the loss is really just a squared error on its kind of these predictions. Okay. Good. And yeah. Um, yeah, the loss is the, the, the squared error. So, so like what comes out here, which is some function of the first k, uh, k minus one labeled examples and the kth labeled example, the loss here is just a squared error on the, on the label for this last one. Yeah, throughout this process, are the weights changing in this case? Uh, so during training, it's, it's changing. But then when we, when we evaluate things, we fix the model, we fix the weights, now we pick a new function from this distribution, a new set of however many examples. We make that prompt, and then we just, no weights change, we just give that prompt, pump it through the transformer, and see what the label is 
that it's giving you for the for the for the last or for the ith data point. And this is, this tells you how accurately you're doing as a function of the number of in context data points you've given it. And you know, as 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 one would have hoped, yeah, when you're giving it the dimension labeled examples, it's basically figured out the linear function in that. Isn't this just supervised learning? So you give a bunch of examples and then you give it a new one and you have it um, predict the output. Uh, good. So, so, so you're saying like, uh, why am I calling this? In context learning. Okay, it just so, looks like supervised learning. So, so, so it is. <clears throat> but the supervised learning problem, it's not learn a linear function. It's learn regression. That's the difference. Okay. So, like usually when you think about supervised learning for a linear function, there is one linear function. I give you a bunch of examples, and you're updating weights to try to learn that function. Here, the function you're trying to learn is the regression function that maps a bunch of labeled uh, a new random linear yeah, it's function. It's a bigger class, but it's still supervised learning. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Are, are you passing those k uh, examples in as like one prompt, uh, or are they like, like k separate prompts? Um, the. Uh, like in the last slide when you when you were doing the training. Oh, so so each function, so you sample a function, yeah. you make one prompt from okay. that function. Okay. That's you all of your K training data points. That's like a single yeah, yeah, think meta that, training yeah, point. Yeah, say we just do like 40 yeah. X's per per yeah. function. That's one prompt. Okay. Then we sample a new function, make new 40 new X's labeled for that function. Yeah. That's another prompt. And the target another is prompt. like a K dimensional vector. Sorry? The target for the output is like a k-dimensional vector. Um, the dimensionality of the, for the yeah, think of it as for each in context x, there's just one real number that we're trying to. Yeah. Uh, when, would it be, would it make sense to try and learn the coefficients of regression instead of just trying to predict the whole output of it? Like, could you help it along by giving it final? Or I guess that's, is that what the linear layer at the end is doing? Um, okay, so this is a good question. So, so if, if, you, if you say you must learn a linear function as represented by, by these coefficients, that's kind of a much easier problem in the sense that you're saying find these coefficients such that, um, you know, when you just do inner product of this with your examples, you're getting these labels. So, 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 that, so that's, uh, that's what makes things much easier. Here it's... You know, it can do whatever weird thing it, it wants. Um, but yeah, if you want to just start unpacking what algorithm does it represent, then... Um... So, so can one conclude that there's some part inside the transformative this that knows about <laughs> linear functions and trying that out, and, and then it, it agrees with the data well? Um, I mean, I mean, you know, how do you solve regression? Like one thing is you do this, you know, you kind of do Gaussian elimination, something like that. Does that know about linear functions? Sort of, but not, you know. Was it trained in algebra? No, 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 it's, it it, it, no. no, it's literally just trained on these, you know, in goes your example. It, it was just chat GPT too. Um, it, sure, sure, but it's, it's randomly, it's that architecture, but it's only been trained on what we give it. There's no language. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. My question is related to uh, uh, whether this is uh, in context learning or supervised learning. So, uh, instead of doing a transformer, I use a deep neural network to feed this data set. Can this deep neural network still perform uh, linear regression? And if so, what kind of deep neural network can also be in context learning? Good, good. Okay, so we'll sort of come to this. Um, so, the answer is so. I tried this a little bit for fully connected neural networks. It's, it seems harder to train. We also did this with LSTMs, and it's sort of it, it works. But yeah, I don't think there's anything special about uh, transformers here. Um, we'll come to that. Um, okay. So uh, you could say, you know, to what extent is this really doing the right thing, or maybe it's just doing some like smoke and mirrors, if you've made up some reasonable heuristics of like fake ways it could be doing this, like it's looking at some nearest neighbor and the training 
set it gave you gave it and so on like these things are, are terrible or maybe it's just doing some sort of uh, very low degree averaging algorithm you know so it, it, it seems like it's doing something fundamental and we'll we'll probe this a bit more um, okay just I'll, so for more complex function classes suppose instead of linear functions suppose we do sparse linear functions okay so if you have a linear function but I tell you you know, I promise you that um, you know, only, only k of the coordinates are non-zero, um, then the number of examples you need is just count k times log the dimension. Um, and things like lasso, L1 regularized regression, ex uh, exploit that. Um, and lo and behold, you know, um, transformers seem to be doing <coughs> basically as well as, as, kind of la as lasso for these sparse things. Um, one sort of interesting, it's just that we're not, yeah, like we don't tell it that the true model is sparse, right? It just, we just give it these random sparse function with labels, random sparse function with labels, and, with, and then we give it a bunch of labeled examples, point to some new random sparse function, and it's doing the right label. Um, so curiously, when you, when you train this, the, the loss curve, so it's flat for a long time, and then it jumps down, and at that point, it's figured out regression, but it doesn't know how to leverage sparsity. Then it's flat for a really long time, and then it jumps down once it's figured out how to exploit sparsity. So it's possible to get this like two step. Uh, Sorry, I have two quick questions. Sorry, the, 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 so if you, you know, the, the, the idea of lasso, you have, you have to give it this regularizer, otherwise it will overfit, right? Unless you give it, throw tons and tons of data at it, right? Lasso helped really help it. So with this, are you throwing enough data at it that it, you know, it's it's reasonable that even even without the regularizer, like the regression algorithm, you find the zeros, find the sparsity? Oh, so so sorry. So this is a plot of so we've trained the thing, and we're saying how does the error in its predictions decrease as the number of x's in this context increases? So this blue line is if you just did regression. We're still in twenty dimensions, so with twenty dimensions, you'd learn the thing. And this curve is sort of what you get if you leverage, you know, I forget if it's three sparse or four sparse or something like that. But, you know, if you leverage that sparsity of your lasso, yeah, with like 10 examples, you can do well. It's really kind of weird, right, that it's actually inferring a prior when you haven't told it about the prior, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Do you have any insight into how that's happening? Um, I'll say a couple of words on that in a sec, but the short answer is, I mean, well, okay, I'll come back there. Uh, for small decision trees, we're doing very well. Um, much better than even things like XGBoost, which is kind of you know what most people would think of as a sort of state of the art decision tree learner. Um, uh, if the function, like the function class is, we sample a random, we randomly initialize a two layer neural network and we use that to label our data points. We can learn that function. And the reference line here is if you were to train a two-layer network via gradient descent over the context, so where you're updating the weights. And you know, the transformer is doing about the same uh, as that. Right? So, so we're sort of comparing this transformer where none of the weights are changing to what you would do if you wanted to learn this function. You'd randomly initialize a uh, you know, two-layer neural network and you train it via gradient descent to match these labels, and that's kind of the reference line. Uh, yeah, John. So did you train one network for each of these different classes, or is it one? Uh, yeah, so we, we did it separately, randomly initialized things for each of them. Although if you did, you know, you don't, you probably didn't need to do that. You could do one network that would do all that of them, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So can you say more about how you construct the yeah, let's see. So um, uh, these are um, yeah. I think just each node you pick a random. So this is it's the you're still in d-dimensional space, but you pick like a random coordinate and maybe a random threshold. And you just build this random decision tree. So, so the distribution of the decision trees 
you know, it's doing something tailored to that distribution in the sense that XGBoost you know, isn't tailored. Uh, but still, even for this distribution, like it's not just doing some naive greedy tree building. That's this. No, it's doing some interesting work. We can talk more about this. Actually, um, uh, from like a theory standpoint, like I think it's doing some interesting uh, things. But right now, the, the training example again. Yeah. And I mean, the number of in content examples doing training and testing are identical. The size of the context window. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you don't, don't, don't you do not test for it, the generalization. Right. You do train fewer examples doing retraining, and you test for more examples. Oh well. So so this like the number of in context x's you have. Um, <coughs> like the way transformers work, like like I you know. Each number of x's, it's trying to do the label given things before that. So in that sense, it's doing its best to learn given as few in context examples as possible. Yeah. Right. So it's sort of uh, you know, and yeah, if we give it many more, well, that like our, that's bigger than our context window, so that doesn't even like make sense. Right. But I guess it's 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 if you train for, for for the context size of five and you test for a context size of ten and it and it gets better every single example you give it. But, but sorry, but testing for a context size of ten, like it doesn't even make sense. Like we're sticking this whole context in, like that's the input. Like, like these things have a fixed context. Yeah, like, right. right. So, <laughs> but I know what you mean, like but yeah. So what's the size of the two layer network in relation to the transport? Oh, these are these are small. Uh, I'm curious if you found an, a task or like a function class where the algorithm learned by the transformer is more than the neural net trained with S3D. <coughs> okay. Okay. So so uh, I'll d I'll do some comparisons with um, LSTMs. I'm not going to do comparisons with fully connected deep neural networks, but I think that that comparison is worth doing. But, uh, okay. Um, let me very quickly, just just for people who, I mean, this is sort of interesting maybe, um, for uh, for regression, um, it really speeds, things, speeds up training to do a curriculum learning. And the natural curriculum is you start by just giving it like much lower dimensional, basically like dimension <coughs> one, examples and dimension two and so on. Um, and you sort of build up the dimensionality to the final dimensionality. Um, so these are some plots. Uh, the orange line, th these are your training losses. Um, without uh, curriculum as the orange line, with curriculum as this blue line, the reason it dips down is because you're like, you're, for lower dimensional things, um, it's an easier problem. Your training loss actually should be lower. Okay, so, so the fact that it kind of goes up reflects the fact that the problem is getting harder as the curriculum is ramping up. But um, you know, this, this first plot, this is, uh, you know, if the dimension is 10, without a curriculum, eventually you learn it's fine. Dimension 20, it takes longer to, to learn without a curriculum. Um, 30 dimensions, 40 dimensions, with 50 dimensions, like uh, maybe we, you know, you need to run it really long without a curriculum to get it. Sort of curiously, the curriculum speeds up training, but it doesn't really improve your final performance. Um, okay. And just a note on kind of generalization. Does it ever hurt the final performance? Like, does it ever get stuck? On the uh, I mean, there's some weird stuff like this little thing, but. Um, when you see plateaus, you mentioned like with lasso, um, yeah, okay. like learning regression and sparsity, do you see those plateaus consistently or just sometimes? Yeah. System. I oh, wonder if yeah. like, speeding up training helps if you don't know how many plateaus there are in a learning problem. Yeah. Um, I learned a few days ago that uh, these large language models have trouble multiplying three digit numbers and getting them accurately. So, how is it doing the linear regression, the mathematics of linear regression here? Oh. Well, okay, so this multiplying three digit numbers, the hard part is that you're giving it in terms of the digits, it needs to figure out how to carry all that stuff. But 
you know, these networks, like, uh, they're allowed to multiply real numbers, right? Like, like the weights get multiplied and so on. So you're putting the numbers in, in the actual neurons here. Um, I mean, the input is a vector, and these layers, you know, you, you multiply these matrices. This is like but all. If the input's a vector and yeah. it's a number, then, then does a certain numbers have a unique word associated with it, or how does the. Yeah, this, I don't understand the difference. Oh, the, there's no. Um, the hard part about multiplication for numbers is the fact that like, people have this weird abstract representation of numbers. That's not inherently the language that, you know, is sort of uh, not the representation that baked into how, you know, transformers work. That's the hard part, right? The, these conventions for carrying things and so on. But... Um, uh, so are you giving the numbers yeah. with, with, uh, with uh, you know, how, how many digits long are the yeah, numbers? I mean, yeah, I don't know. These are probably 32-bit representations of numbers. Right. And and you know computers know how to multiply thirty two bit numbers internally. The, the transformer but knows how to tokenize that. There's no tokenization. I guess that's the point. That uh, I mean, it sort of figures out. Uh, yeah, there's there's no there's no like abstract representations, as in language. We're giving it these vectors in ways that it. Yeah, I, yeah. Maybe that, that's you're, you're wait, but, sorry. No, there's still a question here because is multiplication a primitive operation that is like allowed in this model? I mean, if I think of a standard neural net, it just linear combinations and you know some nonlinear activation functions, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so it's how just does it get multiplication out of that. No, Attention head has multiple. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it's specifically because these are transformers. Well, no, I mean, for fully connected things, you know, they also have inner product. I mean, everything has inner product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Um, and just one, one quick comment. So uh, it takes a while to train these things. Um, like, none of the training took more than a day using a single GPU, but. Um, uh, you don't need that many random functions sampled from your function class. So even with like say 10,000 random linear functions, even if it's only seen 10,000 random linear functions, it's still able to generalize to new uh, linear functions. But that's one thing Surya is going to talk about. Right. So, so, so this is maybe the punchline, right? So, so we were asking, can we train a model to in context learn function classes, linear functions, small decision trees, small neural networks, sparse linear functions? And that's the kind of yes. With an, and, and, and my claim is like with enough training data, large enough models, we should expect to learn a like Bayes optimal algorithm. I feel like this is the expectation that whatever it's going to do, it really should be doing something close to the, with respect to the distribution of stuff you train it on, it should be doing basically Bayes optimally. Even when the Bayes optimal algorithm is complicated, like, you know, lasso doesn't have a closed form expression, or, you know, these decision tree algorithms are probably fairly complicated, but we, this is what you should expect. If you're not learning something close to Bayes optimal, uh, you know, you need to, you know, tweak your hyperparameters, because this is what you should expect. And my claim is this actually holds pretty broadly not just for transformers, but for any architecture, this is sort of what you should be expecting. Um, so in, um, there have been a bunch of more recent papers on this. So this is one posted, uh, some folk here, um, po posted uh, just a month ago, um, which, which kind of starts to try to make this more, more rigorous, maybe this claim. Um, and it show, sort of shows, yeah, like whatever you do, you can get these, you can train these things to basically do the Bayes optimal thing. You can train one model that can do all these different tasks and it figures out when it should do it in a Bayes optimal way. And um... Okay, so given this, I guess the real question are, well, okay, maybe it's doing Bayes optimal things, but are the learned algorithms any good? Um, how much longer can I go? So, um, okay, so, so the question, are the learned algorithms any good? Um, yeah, maybe it's doing some Bayes optimal thing, but um, maybe the real test is like, is the algorithm doing the right thing? One way of looking at that is how well do these algorithms perform? 
perform on out of distribution examples. Do people buy this sort of buy this claim? I'm confused by it. Seems like seems like you're learning a super base, it's super optimal because when you did your linear regression without a you know sparsity prior, when you did that comparison of lasso to uh, you know least squares regression, your your, your transformer was able to figure out just by looking at this that some of the coefficients were zero. Put them in when when regression wasn't and and you know, least squares regression wasn't and least squares regression is sort of what I would consider you know base optimal in the absence of having that prior. That, uh, sure, but if, if your distribution of examples only gives you label vectors where the labels do correspond to sparse linear functions, then with respect to that distribution, the Bayes optimal thing is lasso with the optimal choice of regular right, But eventually, least squares finds that and gets to Bayes optimal, right? They oh, no, no. So, so I guess I mean Bayes optimal in the sense of given the number of labeled examples, the number, sorry, the number of like uh, the context size. Space optimal for that amount of data. I don't mean it's a mathematic sense. I really mean like given three labeled examples, they're really a saying like conditional on the distribution of stuff that I've seen, like what's the right thing here? So on a, on a, just a general argument of like there's no free lunch or minimum description length or you know Shannon optimality or whatever you want to think about it. I feel like there has to be some middle ground like between like where if um, you know, your your network is guessing that it's a sparse prior, but you know, at some point when it actually isn't, or you know, or it's guessing that it's not can't sort of outperform, can't get can't get there faster than least squares regression all of the time, can it? Um, think of it as you know, this this network has been trained on this distribution where it's only ever seen sparse things. So it does, you know, it, in some sense it knows that you're giving it sparse things. It it has learned this kind of distribution oh, over right. problems you've, you've given. You've it. given it a lot of sparse functions, so it's yeah. learned that function that functions can. Yeah, and if you give it a dense function, it'll it'll do garbage. It'll, you know, it's never seen dense functions before. So it has, it has learned the prior over function. I see. Okay, it's learned the prior over functions yeah. just by having seen a lot of functions. Like yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, when you train the transformer, does this uh, for this claim to be correct? Um, no, so the claim is like for every size yes. smaller than whatever our maximum context is, it is doing the base optimal. Given the first three labeled examples, it's an optimal base optimal thing given three. And that's what these curves are sort of showing. So I'm going to do the really annoying thing and say like, now I agree it is trivial kind of thing okay. by, by saying that, uh, yeah, if it's a Gaussian process, like, so we know this, this, this result that these sort of infinitely large networks at least will head towards Gaussian process. The Gaussian process is just a prior over function, right? So it's, it's kind of it's, um, it's able to learn that prior over functions, which is effectively. Yeah. I think the part that's non-obvious is that how it's able to find the the minimum of the, sure, which sure. seems a bit like a what a variational autoencoder is doing or something. Well, like yeah, that. and why it doesn't get lost? Yeah, I mean, so so you know, proving this in a rigorous sense, yes, yeah, certainly yeah. certainly not you know not obvious, but but the claim is yeah, this is what you should expect. And based on this, the claim is really like, are these algorithms actually good? Um, is the claim for any function class or of particular function class? Yeah, for, uh, yeah, for any, the claim that any function class, for any architecture, so you can this is what you like should. A transformer that like, like given examples predict model other, like, like other transformers or like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if it doesn't work. Make it make it bigger. Paint it longer. Pay Amazon more money to you know for their cloud services. Uh, okay, good. So so uh, okay. So so we had a look at um, you know for uh, think of this as now we we've changed this these things and now we're looking at um, prompts. We're looking at uh, things that are sort of basically in a measure zero subset. We're really probing what the algorithm has learned outside of the training distribution. Um, in general, it seems to do quite well. I, let me not talk about this now. I'll talk about this in two slides when there's an extra dimension added. Um, okay. okay, so, so um, suppose instead of transformers, you use LSTMs. 
Um, for the same task, this, this orange line is the LSTM. Again, this is for the distribution of stuff that you train on. And you might say, well, it's a little worse when you have exactly 20 examples. We're training in 20 dimensions, sorry, the linear function is 20 dimensional. So, you know, there should be this sharp kink here. LSTMs, it's a little bit worse, but it's not so bad. It's pretty close to this phase optimal. Um, okay, but then if you start probing what LSTMs have actually learned, what their algorithm is, you start to see that it's actually more like smoke and mirrors, whereas the transformer seems to have learned something really similar to uh, least squares regression. And one way to see this is if you look at, um, so we've trained this thing on noiseless linear regression. What happens if you give it, um, you know, the slightly noisy labels? So we know that this orange curve um, is least squares regression. We know it has this double descent phenomenon, right? So if I give you exactly D points labeled according to linear classifier, and I add a tiny bit of noise to the labels, and I fit that with a linear classifier, that new linear classifier is almost uncorrelated with the true linear classifier. Right? How many people really parse what I just said? You're saying no? This is what double descent means. I'm sorry. Okay. Pick not a linear classifier. Okay, okay. So pick a um, pick a linear model. The D dimensions. Say you pick D uh, random unit vectors, label them according to this linear classifier. Okay, if you fit these labeled points, you get your linear model back. D dimensions, D dimensional linear. Okay. Now add a tiny amount of noise to the D labels. Uh, labels being the points. The, uh, don't change the X's, but the Y yeah. is this linear function evaluated at the X's. Add a tiny bit, bit of noise to these labels and, and then fit those noisy labels with your linear function. Or find a linear function that goes through these D new labeled points. How much is this new linear function different from the true linear model? The claim is, even for a tiny amount of noise, these things become almost uncorrelated. How many people are like, yes, this is double descent, I understand this, I've seen it. Okay, how many people, this sounds, okay. Okay, this, this is great. So, uh, so basically we're saying, suppose you're doing regression, how ill-conditioned is this in the case where you have exactly D labels? And think of it this way. Suppose you have D minus one points, and now the Dth point arrives. Um, D minus one points, there's one direction where you have no variance. This Dth point, it only sticks a tiny bit in this missing direction. So for the D minus one point here, you're... So you're extremely terribly conditioned. If you pick, if you pick D points from a random unit vectors, there is some, the, the smallest eigenvalue of the covariance is uh, really small, which means that when you do regression, it's gonna be poorly conditioned. But this is the sort of curve you get. For, re for regression, that literally, sure. like if you have a little tiny constant amount of noise, say, exactly the examples, basically you fit these noisy points perfectly, but there's no correlation with the true model for linear regression. Okay. For transformers, we get this, this blue, we get this sort of double descent phenomenon. We get this ill condition. What does that mean? That means the transformers have learned a very numerically you know, unstable, algorithm, a very sensitive algorithm, just like regression. Okay. LSTMs, these are two different LSTM architectures, there's no double descent. What does that mean? That means the algorithms they represent, they don't know what the dimension is. They don't know D. They, don't, they, they aren't doing any complicated inverting a matrix of examples. They're not doing what regression does where you have this very numerically sensitive thing. Instead, like, like what are algorithms that don't do double descent? Fit the best model on some half of your points, fit the best model on some other half of the points, average all of these things. It doesn't matter whether you have D examples or D plus one examples, everything is smooth. You don't get this numerical instability. In a more formal sense, you can say 
these LSTMs are learning some sort of low degree functions that don't have this you know, instability of inverting an ill conditioned matrix of examples that regression has. And you could say, oh, this is wonderful. We have numerical stability for LSTMs. But, um, but no, like, like we're training on a distribution where the right answer is, is, is regression, which is numerically unstable. And you know, the fact that, it's, that uh, transformers have this double descent is an indication that it really is doing something resembling kind of the right algorithm, whereas LSTMs aren't. And this, and, and, and this sort of comes back in the sense of if you start giving it strange prompts, if you, if you start giving it um, prompts that are like out of distribution, transformers kind of do the right thing, whereas LSTMs, it's not as robust. So one example, maybe is, suppose you give it a bunch of Xs, we're in 20 dimensional space, but all of the Xs I give you are in some 10 dimensional subspace. Transformers with, with their kind of, you know, numerical instabilities, they know that these things all lie in the low dimensional subspace. LSTMs don't really realize that all of these prompts are in a low, all of these X's are in a low dimensional subspace, and that's manifested by some like bad performance. So if you think about it, if you need to orthogonalize a bunch of vectors with respect to each other, that's a very high degree thing. If that's what your algorithm is doing, you do get this sort of double descent. Transformers seem to be doing this to some extent. LSTMs aren't. Did these transformers have positional encoding? Do they have what? Positional, positional. Uh, yeah, yeah. So these are like the same trained positional encodings. It's kind of a proxy for dimensionality. This is more just to associate which label goes with which example. Model, if it's large enough, you should expect it to learn some basic optimal algorithm. So, can I say that this LSTM is not large enough? <laughs> okay, sort of, yeah. So, you know, you might say, look, this isn't Bayes optimal because of this kink here. It's impressive how well it's doing in distribution, given that the algorithm is like some weird, like not numerically sensitive thing. Right? But, um, uh, yeah, so, okay, both in terms of compute time, like both in terms of training money and I think time tuning parameters, we try, I think we tried to make LSTMs work harder than we tried making transformers work. Given that, you know, I take, take this sort of, you know, it's, if something doesn't work, it's hard to be sure it's impossible, right? So we tried hard for LSTMs, but um, yeah, maybe we just, and, and deeper, bigger, Help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. So with, with small with small LSTMs, it's terrible. These LSTMs are ten times bigger than the transformers. If you go to a hundred times bigger, it will be better. You can train it for a thousand times longer. To, it, it will be better. Some of these issues will probably go away. Um, so there is something special about the transformer structure. Yeah. So so that's uh, good. That's what it says in pink. Yeah. So so. Uh, it seems like transformers are better at learning these, have these the the right, like high you know very non Lipschitz functions. Um, you know, they they are better at learning have these right algorithms. Um, and you know, a big question is what property of them enables this? Are there better architectures? This double descent. I, I think one easy way of saying this is the the optimal algorithm is very non Lipschitz as a function of it. And whereas these LSTMs learn a much more Lipschitz function of that. Yeah. Oh, but, but sorry, but this is uh, this is we give it like noisy labels just just at in context time. They've been trained in a noiseless setting. Oh, they were trained on noiseless. Yeah. 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 No, no. If you give it noise, then everything still looks perfect. So uh, yeah, three, three more minutes. Um, good. So takeaways, uh, maybe yeah, we should expect nearly Bayes optimal behavior of our trained models with respect to whatever distribution of stuff uh, we train them on. Um, and things become interesting when extrapolation is successful, so significantly beyond the training distribution. And that's really what Surya is going to start talking about. Um, 
And then, yeah, one big question is what architectures are especially successful at doing this um, and why? Um, a couple, a couple of questions. So, um, one question is, okay, so, so suppose we take for granted that these models will do base optimal things. Um, what can we learn from that? So, so one thing which like not many maybe the theorists in the audience might care about, like, are there any nice distributional information theoretic theoretical questions where we don't know the answer and we'd like to know the answer? One question. So, so how many people know about like planted clique? Planted clique, you know, your random graph. You want to know, uh, you know, can you can you efficiently find a uh, a clique in it? Uh, what? How big does a clique need to be for efficient algorithms? Um, there's a this problem is phrased with respect to a distribution of graphs, and you know, if you think that we can train these things to do something optimal. Um, no, at least we might be able to know the answer. Well, what for what size cliques can you actually solve things? Um, there are a number of other uh, sort of interesting information theoretic things that people aren't really sure about. Um, how many people know about trace reconstruction? Uh, anyway, um, so I was going to ask if there are if there are uh, um, anyway, there, there are a bunch of kind of problems the theory community maybe might care about. That even just knowing what the right answer is would be helpful, and this is, might be a nice way of, of, of learning the right answer. Um, so a big question. So you know, we, here we are training these transformers just to do this kind of learning tasks. But what are the actual implications for language models? Do language models do regression? Um, you know, to what extent can they? Um, and then also language models, you know, beyond this in context learning type stuff. What other algorithmic primitives can they do? So these large language models, um, they seem very good at binary search. If you can play 20 questions with ChatGPT and it's very good. If you say, like, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 500 million, 32,000, blah, 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 you know, you guess, I'll tell you if it's higher or lower than my true number, it'll exactly do binary search. Is that something they hard coded? Maybe. Um, but uh, binary search seems to be a pretty fundamental algorithmic primitive that um, people use in conversation. Right? If I say some vague stuff, you ask questions and kind of do binary search to probe what I'm talking about. Right? Um, sorting. Uh, do large language models, can they sort? Sort of. Um, and I guess, yeah, so question like what sorts of algorithmic primitives can these language models do? And the other question is the ones where they can't really do it, what happens if you give them the ability? How much better do they become at language modeling if you give them this ability, and how do you do it? So maybe I'll end. Uh, maybe I'll end it. Well, OK, I'll, uh, let, let me just skip to one, one last question. Um, Related to this in context learning ability is also this kind of meta question of why are language models, large language models, fairly robust to out of domain prompts? Why can we condition on like kind of a zero measure <laughs> subset and still get reasonable behavior? Like image classification, all this stuff, we kind of know it's very brittle to out of domain uh, stuff. Why are, is, what, what's there inherent about language that gives this robustness? Um, and you know, it seems like prompt engineering, or adding clever prefixes even, um, can improve this sort of robustness. Um, and maybe both from a theory as well as sort of soft theory standpoint, I think it's worth trying to formalize the power of these uh, of prompt engineering. People tend to think of prompt engineering as just applying band-aids to you know, slightly broken aspects of a language model. But I think it's a bit more fundamental than that. Um, so maybe just to end with one with, with one comment. Um, so with people, when you ask them a kind of absurd, nonsensical prompt, often they don't do much. But you can add a reasonable, you, know, you can do some prompt engineering to get them to do the right responses. So you know, I mentioned maybe on Monday I made a stupid comment about you know, anthropologists going to remote villages and saying, 
you know, suppose there's some island. Uh, all of the bears on that island are pink. Ivan lives on that island. If Ivan sees a bear, what color is it? Okay. So, so, you know, if you do the logic, okay, it must be pink. Um, and, you know, you ask some, some people, they, they, don't, they don't do this reason. And, you know, people have been doing these sorts of hypothetical questions for, for a century. Um, in the maybe 70s and 80s, I forget the name, a, a Harvard uh, psychologist was looking at this in children. And the results are all over the place. But he ended up basically finding that, you know, if you, he wanted to know, like, at what age do children start to do these things? But he basically found that, um, you know, among, among kids, whether or not they say the right thing, uh, um, you know, you can basically make them do the right thing if you just prefix things by saying, okay, let's, uh, let's play pretend. Okay, let's make believe. Blah, blah, blah. And then they'll do this absurd hypothetical of some island where all the bears are pink. And if you don't do this, they sort of say, you know, I don't, like, what do you want? You're conditioning on this absurd thing. What do you want me to do? But if you sort of say, oh, okay, let's play pretend, then do this. Um, so anyway, so, so I think this like notion of prompt engineering, I think it's much more fundamental than just like a band-aid over bad language models. I think it's something more fundamental about how languaging work, how language works, especially when you're conditioning on these almost measured zero things. Um, let me in there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Greg, for the wonderful talk. Um, while we get set up for the next talk, um, Surya, we can take a few questions. Yeah, uh, in the same way that you have this nice example where LSTM clearly fails to learn the right. In the same way you have this example where LSTM clearly fails to learn the right algorithm, do you have any clean, isolated examples like this where a transformer is also doing the wrong thing? Yeah, so, so maybe I'll say it's not that clear that LSTMs are doing. Oh, well, yeah. I'm uh, convinced. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, not really, no. Um, I mean, we didn't probe extremely complicated um, functions. I mean, you know, I guess the, you know, there's the work out of Harvard showing like for very, very non continuous functions like parity. Even then, you train it for a very long time and you can get transformers to learn. But you can also get fully connected neural nets to learn it too. Right? So, um, uh, yeah, so what functions are super hard? I mean, I think this is kind of related to this more general question of what tasks actually require weight updates, which I didn't get to talk about much. But um, it seems like across the board, if you have a model and you're either going to do in-context learning or you're allowed to literally like update your weights, the like gradient descent over your little in-context examples, also you can think of as kind of fine-tuning. Fine-tuning is always better. If you can like update your weights, it's always, it's always better. Um, but um, yeah, are there problems where like you can't hope to do anything unless you update weights? I think that's a really nice question. And that's inherently kind of computational. Thanks. Okay, sounds good.